our world and beyond. Space, in partnership with the European Space Agency. These are the space cadets, young engineers with a job that's quite literally out of this world. They've turned their dreams of working in space into a down-to-earth career. I love working on the Mars rover mission because it is very cool. Um, I think most people in the world would agree that working on a mission that's ultimately going to trundle around on Mars is pretty cool. The coolest thing about this job is that you know, you are driving a spacecraft which is in another planet. I mean, how cool is that? Just, I think, five years ago, my biggest dream would be, uh, was actually just to touch something that was going to space. And now I'm working with instruments that are going to space. It's unbelievable. <laughs> In Finnish Meteorological Institute, we do weather forecasts and we do all kinds of research. Uh, we do Arctic research, marine research, space weather research, and we have a small space lab downstairs where we build space instruments. We are now heading to the space lab. Here is the space lab. This is the main part of the lab. Uh, on, my, on my back there is a clean room where the actual magic happens and the flight instruments are built. So we've got a full jacket, it's anti-static, hairnet, shoe covers, and if you're a man of that persuasion, you have to have a beard cover as well. I love coming down here. If you've had a long, tiring day and you walk past the windows to the clean room and just look inside and go, yeah, I did that, and I made that, and that bit's my bit, I did that bit. This is uh, the antenna which with I work every day. And basically, uh, every day we have a pass, so we communicate with the spacecraft, we send commands, we receive commands. And then, well, basically here we are in the middle of nowhere, we're in Febreros, roughly 20 kilometers away from the nearest town. And this antenna is located in here because we want to minimize the interferences, such as the ones from mobile phones and so on and so forth. Maria, Abby and Mark already have significant responsibilities. Maria works on a Finnish mini-satellite and weather instruments for ESA's ExoMars EDM mission. Abby is developing the structure of the ExoMars rover and Mark plans the operation of ESA's Venus Express satellite. So this is Venus Express. This is the spacecraft that I, I work on and actually the spacecraft is four times bigger than this model. Uh, as most of the satellites it's a cube and it has different panels with different functionalities around it. This is Aldo One nanosatellite. This is mainly built by students and uh, when it gets ready it will be the first whole satellite built in Finland. This was the first project that I was in after my studies or even before my studies ended. My job is actually a structures engineer on this project, so I'm in charge of making sure that the actual, the body of it, the body of the vehicle, so this, this what we call the bathtub, which contains all of the instruments of the rover, the solar arrays and some other bits and pieces, are all structurally strong enough to withstand the launch and the landing, the entry into the atmosphere, all of those kind of things. So the first thing we can see here, this is the high gain antenna, and this is what allows us to communicate with it. We send the commands, we receive the data from here. Obviously, you've got to start your career somewhere. I was sizing the, the brackets and the cleats, so I had to work out exactly how many brackets we needed along the edge of the panels to take the loads, and how many fixings we needed at any point, how big those fixings needed to be. So that's where I started, brackets and cleats. Three were inspired by the idea of exploring our solar system. I wanted to show you one of my favorite books from my childhood. 
my favorite part of the book is probably planet Venus because there's this nice teacher lady who wants to put a statue uh, she made herself uh, uh, on the Venus. But the statue explodes because there's so hot and so huge pressure on the surface of Venus. So I think this book is, is the reason why I don't think Earth as the whole world. I, I know that there's other worlds and I would like to explore these other worlds. This picture we have here is one of the outputs that we get from one of these bars in here. And actually this, this image of, of Venus, this is a mosaic of different pictures, is very special to me because uh, I remember the first day that I came in here, uh, my first supervisor showed it to me and he told me that is the sort of, of stuff that you will be doing. You will be working, putting things together to get a picture like that. When I was at school, I heard in the news that UK scientists and engineers were working on a project called Beagle 2. And at the time, I had no idea that Britain even had a space agency or did missions that went into space. So it really opened my eyes to the career possibilities that do exist in space in the UK. So this is where it all started for me and got me into the space industry. Abby, Mark and Maria are all educated to master's level, while Maria continues studying towards a doctorate. In their mid-twenties, they're on the first steps of the career ladder, and that means plenty of learning on the job. I've had to learn soldering, I have to learn uh, programming and testing. I had never had used any vacuum equipment before, now I have to build vacuum systems and control the pressure in vacuum systems. I have to program the weather chambers, the temperature chambers, and I have to know these instruments. Typically, you start, uh, you start as a trainee or as a young graduate trainee. And in that, you're given a project that you have to develop, which is not operationally critical, so in your learning process, you will not affect any operational stuff. You will not damage any spacecraft or whatsoever. And still, it gives you the chance to learn, to develop your skills, and hopefully to provide something useful for the mission at the end. I mean, this was my case, for instance. The material challenges that we face when we're looking at the space environment are things like the thermal environment, the very cold nature of space, the radiation environment, and also the vacuum of space. So materials don't behave anything like they behave down here on Earth. You get certain plastics that just vaporize in space. You get brittle behavior of metals and polymers because you've got that very low temperature. So that's an area that I really had to learn a lot about when I started working here. Oh, 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 everything can go wrong. Just recently, I uh, managed to broke one of our really important qualification instrument. So uh, we had to start again, whole qualification process which takes months. We give the voltage also to this instrument through these cables. And we had the banana connectors and they all look, look the same. So I mixed up five and 12 voltages and the instrument didn't say boom, <laughs> but I would imagine it, it, if it wanted to speak, it would have said I'm boom or something. <laughs> so one Monday we came into the office and we found out that we had skipped a critical operation of the spacecraft. And that can lead to a safe mode. A safe mode is when the spacecraft is shut down, it shuts all the systems down and it goes to sleep to prevent any further damage. It was actually was a, an overlap in between two different commands. And uh, well, at that time we were lucky. And we, we actually identified the issue and we, we resolved it. But, you know, had, it been, had the circumstances been different, we might have had a huge problem. 
The day-to-day -day business of steering satellites or building rovers or weather stations to go to Mars demands skill, knowledge and dedication. Throughout that, however, they never lose sight of the unique nature of a career in space. I think the space industry is quite a privileged industry to work in because whilst you are still managing projects and meeting schedules and deadlines and creating a, a product at the end of the day that requires a certain amount of processes done in it, you can also come down to the clean rooms and look through the window and see you're part of a spaceship and think, that's going to Mars, and I did that bit, and you don't get that anywhere else. Basically what we do is we sit in front of computers, but uh, I mean, if you keep in mind what you're doing, if you keep in mind that you are the one driving the spacecraft, you are the one who, say, who coordinates and, you know, and, and says when this particular picture is being taken, and then you get that picture on and say, wow, this is a picture of Venus we've taken here and we've done it. Not so long ago we were doing vibration and shock tests for our instruments and it was so fun to see them shake and to get shocked. I took videos and I have showed them to my friends and I would like to see even bigger test facilities. I know that there is uh, tons but not in Finland. I would like to see some huge vacuum chambers, maybe solar simulators. I think that would be the best best part. And of course, if I could ever see a launch of the real rocket, it would be so cool. Fine shots, daytime launch, which is not always the case, obviously.